If your overbearing parents became outright murderous one day, what would you do? Parents everywhere have been taken over by an uncontrollable urge to kill their kids, and nothing can change their minds. So I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat your insane parents in Mom and Dad. <laughs> Listen up, how to beaters. In the treacherous land of Raid Shadow Legends, a limited animated series has emerged known as Raid Call of the Arbiter. Brace yourselves for this brand new animated series and for episode one, Gaelic, slated to drop on May 18th. But before that epic showdown, arm yourselves with the trailers to get a taste of the impending madness. Now, let's talk survival strategies. The animation in Call of the Arbiter is like a well-crafted weapon honed to perfection. It strikes with precision, immersing you in a world of danger and intrigue. The visuals unleash a dark allure, reminding me of spine-tingling animated shows that have sent shivers down my spine. As you bear witness to this animated odyssey, it will stir echoes of familiar tales, adding a thrilling new layer to Raid's established universe. But wait! There's more. Prepare for a slew of Call of the Arbiter related features surging through the ranks of Raid Shadow Legends. Delve into the depths of Champion Bios, unearthing the lore behind figures like Gaelic, Aethel, Kale, and Elhain, who take the stage in this grand spectacle. And fear not, beloved fan favorites like Death Knight and Sile of the Drakes shall also grace your presence. The clash of titans unfolds before your eyes, intensifying the heart-pounding excitement. Survivors, seize this moment, for it marks a turning point in the ever-evolving landscape of Raid. Whether you're a seasoned warrior or a fresh recruit, this launch brings forth a wealth of enticing offerings. And lo, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity arises. Each and every one of you will have the chance to claim Artak, one of the five new characters from the show as a legendary champion for free. A gift that materializes merely by logging into Raid for seven days from this very moment until the evening of July 24th. But hold on, brave souls who have yet to embark on this perilous journey. Fear not the unknown, for I shall guide you through the darkness. Follow my link in the description, or heed the call of the QR code that materializes before your eyes. Claim your free starter pack, laden with enticing in-game loot, and let it bolster your chances of survival. So gather your wits and your allies, fellow survivors. Raid Shadow Legends beckons you to stand tall in the face of the Arbiter's Call. Unleash your inner champion, for in this wasteland of heroes and monsters, your destiny awaits. This teenager is going to be the only person who can save her brother's life. This girl Carly is flirting with her boyfriend, Damon, and starts to make plans to meet up later today. But she's interrupted when her little brother barges into the room, telling the girl to come downstairs. She goes downstairs to have breakfast with the rest of the family, and asks her parents if she can go to the movies with her boyfriend, but they insist she can't. Both her parents disapprove of her dating him, and her mother reminds Carly that she needs to be home that evening because her grandparents will be coming over for dinner. The teenager tries to push back, but eventually gives up, but not before showing her parents some sass. Later, Carly's mother drives her to school and tries to talk to her. She wishes that the girl would open up for once and wants to connect with Carly, but the teenager doesn't care. She has her own friends in life now, but has no idea her parents are going to hunt her down. Back in the house, Carly's father Brent is playing with his son, and even though he's tickling the boy roughly, his son is having fun. The family's housekeeper's in the kitchen with her daughter, and the father tells him he's headed to work. Saying goodbye to his son, he walks out of the house and leaves him alone with the two ladies. The boy Josh continues playing and runs around the house with a toy helicopter, while the housekeeper and her daughter continue working in the kitchen. As he goes around the room, the mini TV suddenly turns to static, and the woman glares at her daughter. Josh then drops his toy when he spots the garage door, and remembers a traumatizing memory. One time, he saw birds pecking at an injured animal and scared them off, so he could rescue the creature. He hid the animal inside of a shoebox that he kept in his dad's sports car, and tried to nurse it back to health, but then discovered it died. Before he could react, the garage door opened, and Josh sprinted out to hide. His father entered the garage and is furious to discover the body in his precious car. He's dropping from under his bed. Josh overheard his parents arguing about Brent's expensive sports car and the dead animal he left inside. Suddenly, the boy is jolted from his memory by his housekeeper brutally bludgeoning her own daughter in front of them, and this is the beginning of a massacre. Okay. 
This is terrifying. Given the woman's sudden change of behavior, it is clear that something much bigger is wrong here. Josh was at home with the housekeeper and her daughter the whole time, so he actually has all the information he needs to piece together this puzzle. Josh should have realized the woman did not scream or fight with her daughter before killing her. Since they were getting along well just a few minutes ago, this means that the woman was motivated by a spur of the moment fight and a few seconds of anger. It is also clear that she did not plan this, as the housekeeper used the meat tenderizer, the weapon closest to her. She would also have many opportunities to kill her daughter in the privacy of their own home if she wanted. Committing murder in front of a witness in someone else's house is a terrible idea. This means that something in the room completely altered this woman's perception of reality and made her kill the girl. If I were in Josh's shoes, I would immediately look for the root cause of this. A chemical in the food would be my first suspect, as the woman was preparing a meal just before she snapped. Taking a closer look, this is actually very unlikely. Much like any other groceries, these ingredients are from a regular supermarket and have been in the family's kitchen for some time. The housekeeper has also been cooking with the ingredients all morning, even when the whole family was home, and they've also eaten the food, yet no one else is behaving differently. With all other causes ruled out, Josh should realize that the strange static he saw appear behind the housekeeper is the true culprit. Not only did it cause her to freeze up instantly, it is also the only part of the entire morning that has been out of the ordinary. The audio and video for television programs come through the air in the form of signals such as radio waves. Every house in this neighborhood has satellite dishes on their roofs, which receive these signals, which are then channeled to a place on TV. In the long term, Josh can tell the police or his older sister what he knows, and they can push for a plan to uncover the source of the killer static by investigating local or national TV stations. Once there, the priority should be in destroying or disabling the broadcast transmission tower or any equipment that facilitates satellite transmissions. This ensures that the root cause of the housekeeper's madness is stopped and can no longer play on television screens throughout the country. Right now, Josh needs to get away from the housekeeper and his home to find a place not likely to have people who have already watched the broadcast. His best bet will be to find a break into a neighbor's empty house. Since this is a school day, there will be no one home to have seen the static, and he can smash all the screens capable of broadcasting signals and hide out there for the day till the police deal with this matter. The mother Kendall's at a dance aerobics class with other moms. Their creepy instructor checks out his students openly, but the woman's friend doesn't seem to mind. After the class, she has coffee with her blonde friend Jenna, and the woman starts complaining that no matter what they do, they'll look terrible. Everyone's getting older, and Jenna has gotten better of her own daughter's youth. That's when the mother realizes she's missing some money, and her friend is certain that Kendall's daughter has been stealing from her, but the woman remains skeptical. At school, Carly's applying makeup with her friend Riley, the blonde woman's daughter, who starts complaining how her parents never give her enough money to satisfy her needs. Another girl rushes into the restroom, and Carly hands over a wad of cash in exchange for some illegal substances. This is why the girl stole money from her own mom, and that's when an alarm goes off. Something strange has happened and they walk out of the restroom to follow a crowd of other students. Outside, the mob finds a large group of parents waiting at the gate and calling for their kids to come to them. Some have gotten so eager they have started to climb the fence and have to be subdued by the police. Carly doesn't see her parents and has no idea what's going on. Even the teachers seem confused. They know that there isn't a good reason why the students need to leave school early and do their best to hold off the adults. Seeing his mom, this boy here breaks free of his teacher and runs towards his mother. He climbs over the fence and the woman drags him off school grounds, but suddenly she pulls out her sharp keys and stabs her son with them. It's horrifying, and the parents start to climb into the school, acting like total animals. The students all run away in a panic, and Carly spits off in the pack with her friend Jenna, who insists they head for her car. Total chaos has erupted as the parents grab any weapon they can and start to brutally murder their kids. The security guards try to fight them back, but there are too many parents out for blood. The two girls make it to the parking lot, but spot a horde of adults charging straight for them. They close their eyes, bracing for the worst, but Carly Carthy is stunned when the adults run right by her without slowing down. Okay. Carthy survived this time due to pure luck. She will need to be a lot more alert to make it through the nightmare day she has ahead of her. If she had just noticed the many signs around her, she would have seen much earlier that the parents were the real danger and that she should have run for her life. An evacuation of the entire school like this would usually only happen for a routine drill or a serious emergency. Carthy should have realized that this is something else entirely because the students were never informed of a drill for the day and taking a look around will show her that there are no signs of smoke, collapse, or even panicked students coming from within the school. Looking at the adults at the gate, 
case. She should also know so the teachers and police are not on the same side as the parents. These authority figures are visibly calm and rational, while the parents are acting very out of character by coming to the school in a horde so far before their scheduled pickup time. They are even outright breaking the law by climbing fences and fighting with the police. What's more terrifying is that absolutely none of the parents are able to coherently verbalize why they need their kids to come to them right now. If there's an active bomb scare or other disaster, the parents should find it very easy to say, get out now, there's a bomb in the school. The fact that they are just making generic pleas for their kids to come meet them makes it crystal clear that something is wrong with their minds and they cannot be trusted. Now with that said, Carthy should take her friend and run back into the school. The parents don't seem concerned about wanting to storm the place and only want to be reunited with their kids so no one will pursue them. The building is also huge and there will be many rooms that they can lock themselves in and barricade with furniture. Since this is a school, it will be full of equipment such as computers and phones that will allow them to call for help or research what is going on. By using a computer in the school staff room or approaching any student to borrow their phone, Carthy can do a quick check on the local news. A collective change of behavior affecting the parents across the region must have compelled them to leave their respective separate offices to come find their kids in the middle of the day. This might be a sign that they've been worked into a mass hysteria by a widely broadcast news story or rumor that has spread like wildfire. If Carthy had thought to check the news, she can quickly assess if this is indeed the case. At the very least, something on this larger scale that so many people have heard of is very likely to be reported, and she can find out more about it. Meanwhile, Carthy's boyfriend Damon gets home from taking his tests and finds his dad passed out drunk on the couch with a TV on. The teen can barely hide his disappointment as he starts to clean up the man's mess. But while he's taking the trash outside, Damon hears what sounds like a dying animal wheezing. He looks around, but can only see the power lines connecting houses and satellite dishes in the roofs. Heading back inside, Damon discovers that his dad is missing from the couch and the TV has switched to a strange static. Suddenly, the older man emerges from behind Damon and backhands him across the face. The teenager begs the man not to do this, knowing how cruel he can be, but his dad ignores him. He smashes a glass bottle against a table and starts to approach him with the jagged remains in his hands. The man slashes him across the arm, and the teenager runs away, pushing the table at his father. The guy loses his balance and falls over right onto the broken bottle. The glass pierces his neck, and the man starts to go into shock. Damon tries to help, but his father won't stop trying his best to hurt his son until finally he bleeds out. That makes one victim down, with eight more to go. Across town, Kendall's in her car and checks her purse again, realizing that her daughter must have stolen her money while she wasn't looking. That's when she recalls meeting an old friend some time ago to ask for for a job, only for the man to tell her he no longer has faith in her skills because she's been a full-time mom for so long. The woman breaks down in tears, feeling overwhelmed by responsibility and that she can't trust her own children. Kendall's interrupted by a phone call and finds out her sister is going into labor. Meanwhile, Carthy and Wiley make it to the friend's home. The place seems empty, but the girl notices several opened bottles left in the kitchen, and it's clear someone has used the blender very recently. Curious, the friend wanders upstairs while Carly turns on the TV. She sees a news report that parents are killing their children all over the country. This is terrifying, and the girl realizes that she's in grave danger, where even the ones she trusts may be a threat. Carly realizes that her friend has gone quiet and goes upstairs to find her. In the bedroom, she sees Jenna strangling her own daughter, and as soon as the woman realizes Carly's there, she greets her like nothing just happened. If that makes two victims down with seven more to go. Okay, oddly enough, Carly should feel nothing but relieved at what just happened. She has seen firsthand that both the parents at her school and her friend's mother only targeted their own children and ignored everyone else. With these adults all acting irrationally, there is no reason to think that her own parents would be any different. This means that there are only two people in the entire country who pose a direct threat to Carthy at the moment, her own mom and dad. Right now, neither of them is nearby, and they in fact have no idea where Carthy is or how to find her. This is a huge opportunity that Carthy should not waste. She should instantly go into survival mode with the sole aim to avoid her parents at all costs until they are cured or dead. The first thing Carthy should do is make sure any tracking apps mom and dad have installed on her phone are dealt with. If she managed to get her phone back before escaping the school, putting it in airplane mode or even smashing it to pieces could work. But a more clever plan would be to give it to a stranger she meets on the street. This will send anyone tracking her on a wild goose chase for hours, buying her more time to escape. Carthy can also take the opportunity to pocket her friend's phone as a replacement. After all, she would likely approve. Knowing the deceased teenager, she would be the first to say, you can only take my phone over my dead body. Now, if I were Carly, I would avoid visiting my boyfriend, relatives, or anyone else my parents will know I have ties with. These are the first places they will think of to look for me. 
This also means that returning home is out of the question, and going back to try and save my little brother is simply too big of a risk to take. This has been happening for hours now, so the boy might already be dead or on the run. Sadly, the odds are way too low that I'll be able to find and save him if I go looking for him. Before leaving her friend's house, Carthy can take a few minutes to quickly gather the supplies she will need to stay on the go for the next couple of weeks. The house is lavish and likely has many valuables laying around, with the only other occupant more concerned about making sure her daughter is dead than what Carthy is doing. Carly has free reign to take as much as she wants. Bedside tables will be her best bet to find loose cash, and dressers will be the best spots to find jewelry Carly can sell or use to barter with. If she can find any credit cards, she will also be free to use them up to this rich family's limit before having to resort to cash. Once she has everything she needs, Carly can head out fully prepared to face a few weeks hiding out of motels around the country, if need be. At the hospital, Kendall arrives to find the place in chaos, and watches a news report warning of the murderous hysteria parents are going through. That's when the woman's sister calls out to her, and they head to the delivery room. Kendall's sister fights through the pain and gives birth to a healthy baby girl. Everyone is overjoyed that things went well, and the child is handed over to the woman. This woman clearly cares about her child and can't stop smiling at her baby and playing with her, but suddenly the monitor screen turns to static. The mother's demeanor changes immediately and Kendall realizes she's holding onto the baby too tightly. The staff members hold the sister down, and Kendall manages to wrestle the child away from her, but the sister isn't giving up. She gets out of the bed and approaches Kendall, determined to kill the child. After her sister is restrained, the mother takes care of her niece when a doctor comes over and explains they need to take the baby away for protection. No one can figure out what is causing parents to act this way, and this is the best thing they can do. Reluctantly, she hands over the girl and heads home, passing by a group of fathers glaring at their newborn children. Not even babies are safe and if a cure isn't found, the entire human race could go extinct. Meanwhile, Carthy's running home and trips, falling to the ground. Getting up, she sees a man holding a bloody baseball bat and screams in terror. She rushes to get away, but Damon finds her and calms the girl down, reassuring his girlfriend that the man isn't interested in her. Looking back, they see the guy pick up his man, but doesn't do anything threatening to the couple, and the survivors make a plan to pick up her little brother, then leave together before her parents can get to them. Arriving back at her house, they notice that the housekeeper is in the kitchen, but as they get closer, they see that the woman has been mopping up blood. Terrified, Carthy screams at her to leave and quickly heads upstairs to find her brother. After the woman goes home for the day, the boyfriend sees a news report of a father who recently killed his children. The man being interviewed knows what is happening is terrible, but admits that it still feels good that he murdered his kids. Okay. In the chaos, the staff in the delivery room has totally missed a huge clue. Moments before Kendall's sister started crushing her baby, the killer static played on the screen showing her vital signs. Unlike television screens which receive radio waves or satellite signals, this vitals monitor likely operates on an internal system where nodes attached to the new mother detect her vitals and transmits the signals directly to the monitor through traditional wiring. This means that blocking TV signals and destroying receptor satellite dishes will not be enough to stop the static from entering people's homes. Whatever Whatever is causing the static and this widespread murder can travel through wireless signals to affect televisions, but can also travel through electrical signals like it did in the hospital room. Something even scarier the hospital staff should have noticed is that this killer static showed signs of human intelligence by waiting till the exact right time before playing in front of the new mom. Active labor typically lasts for between 4 to 8 hours, so it is likely that the poor woman was in the delivery room next to the monitor for many hours before giving birth. She was also behaving like normal and holding her baby love lovingly right after it was born. That means that whoever or whatever is behind the static was able to see and understand what the birthing process is and is capable of laying dormant till the baby has been born and the mother had it in her arms before it struck. Even if a cure can never be discovered, there is still hope. As Damon has seen from this interview with a father who has been infected with the killer instinct, parents affected aren't entirely lost. This man here continues to be self-aware and rational, saying he knows what he feels is terrible but just can't help feeling that way. It seems like parents only get completely taken over by the killer urges when near their children, and can remain functional members of society otherwise. Even though she's affected by the static at the hospital, Kendall isn't taken over by the urge to fight her children right away. In fact, she fought hard against her sister to protect her niece, then stayed at the hospital till the doctor took the baby away. If scientists can't identify the cause and find a cure, these parents can carry on with their jobs and be exposed to more static so long as they are kept away from their children. A structured way society can adapt to all parents being infected is to identify the number and ages of children in each family and pair them with a similar family on the other side of the country. The state can then swap custody of the children between families such that each family raises the other's kids. Pregnant women can be paired up in the same way so they can swap infants at birth, ensuring that all parents continue to raise kids whom they do not feel like killing. The father Brent returns and catches Damon in his house. The man 
and is agitated and goes on a tirade about how kids these days are too promiscuous for his liking. In the bedroom, Carly finds her brother hiding under his bed, but he's scared to death and doesn't want to come out. His sister tells him that they need to leave without getting spotted and heads downstairs with the kid, but that was her biggest mistake. The boy calls out to his dad and the man is furious. He's determined to kill his children and rushes out. Damon tries to stop him, but the man throws the teenager to the ground and knocks him unconscious. The siblings run for their life as their father chases them through the house in a murderous rage. Just before he can corner them, the man slips on one of his son's toys and tumbles to the ground hard, knocking himself out cold. Seizing their opportunity, Carthy and Josh lock themselves in the basement. The siblings see a pool table that has been smashed to pieces. This damage was actually done three weeks earlier, when their parents first expressed the resentment they have towards Carthy and Josh. That day, Brent buys a pool table and assembles it by hand. When his wife sees it, she's not pleased and thinks he's having a midlife crisis. The man clarifies that he's building it for them so the adults can have their own space in the basement away from the clutter their children create. Just speaking about this causes Brent to lose his temper, and the man becomes more and more unhinged. He picks up a sledgehammer and smashes the pool table to bits. This is terrifying, as it becomes clear that the man was already full of rage at his kids, and at his breaking point long before parents all over the country started going crazy. Crazy. He rants that the carefree teenager he once was would have been utterly disappointed at the boring dad he grew up to be. Surprisingly, Kendall isn't scared off by his antics. She actually empathizes with him, sharing that she once had big dreams in life and in her career too. The woman reflects that even though they had always planned to start a family and have children, it did not turn out how she had expected at all. She never intended for parenthood to completely take over her life this way. The couple sit helplessly, ready to accept the fact that they will never be anything other than mom and dad again. Meanwhile, Kendall races back home as a broadcast on the radio warns parents not to go home to their children. But the mother doesn't care. She refuses to turn around and enters her house to find her husband lying unconscious in the kitchen. The woman wakes him up and they plot to work together to flush their kids out of the basement. Approaching the door, she asks them to unlock it, but Carthy refuses to let them in. That makes their father furious and he pounds on the door demanding the kids open up. Okay, Carthy and Josh just made a huge mistake. Even before going into the basement, they saw that Brent had knocked himself unconscious and that their mother isn't anywhere in the house. Quartering themselves by locking themselves in the basement is the absolute worst thing they could have done. To add to this dumb mistake, they don't form any sort of escape plan and spend the entire time sitting by the door and crying. While it is understandable to be hurt that their parents are trying to kill them, Carthy should at least be thinking of ways to actively protect her little brother from them. Sitting and doing nothing in the basement gives their father time to regain consciousness and their mother time to get home, leaving them trapped with both adults back to full strength. Instead of hiding and shutting down, Carthy should have used a frying pan from the kitchen or one of these lamps to hit her dad in the head while he's laying on the ground to make sure he's knocked out. After that, they can take what they need and get out of the house. This means leaving David even behind, but since he's not Brent's son, he is in no danger. Carthy would still have his phone number and will be able to call him several hours later to check if he has regained consciousness and make plans to meet back up. If they want to try and cure the man, the siblings can tie up their father's hands and legs with clothes or wires they find around the house to make sure he won't pose a threat even when he wakes up. Then, they can wait for him to wake up so they can try to reason with him. The priority here would be to find out what his thought process is in wanting to kill his kids, and if the underlying belief causing these thoughts can be eliminated. In the animal kingdom, mother pigs sometimes kill their children in a behavior called savaging. Research has shown that savaging occurs differently in separate populations of pigs, and is affected by several factors within their environment. A study conducted by a Canadian university discovered that savaging occurs more frequently when the pigs are exposed to disruptive sounds, but reduced when they are exposed to constant light. This shows that external factors that can be controlled can be used to reduce this kind of behavior. While Brent is in a crazed state and may not be able to pinpoint the cause of his murderous intent, Carly can still look out for clues about factors that bother him or calm him down. If her father is motivated by the same factors as the savaging pigs, he may complain about loud noises but seem calmer when allowed to rest in a bright room for some time. This kind of study which Carthy can try will be key reversing the effects of this day, as it will tell us what environmental factors we can use to recondition the parents not to attack their children. Kendall realizes that her kids aren't going to open the basement door and has an idea. She gets an electric saw and starts to cut through the wood around the lock. With no other choice, Josh takes out the gun he stole from his father earlier and shoots through the door. The bullet hits his mother in the arm while she's hurt. This only seems to make her angrier. The woman scolds her husband for even having a gun in the house and being careless enough to use Josh's birthday as the code to the lock. The adults go to the bathroom where Brent pours alcohol in his wife's wound and bandages her up. Carly and her brother can hear the mom screaming in pain from the basement. 
The boy is scared, but Carly reassures them that she's going to help them get out of this. Upstairs, Kendall is all bandaged up and hatches a new plan with her husband. They push aside their stove and unplug the gas line. Then, using a garden hose they took from the backyard, the pair tape it to the gas valve. Kendall takes the other end of the hose and goes back to the yard. She notices a foul smell coming from the trash bins and sees that the housekeeper has thrown her daughter's body inside, carrying on her mission. The woman loosens the screen on the basement window and puts the end of the hose inside. She then seals the hole with duct tape before piling dirt over the window and packing it firmly so the opening becomes airtight. Brent turns on the gas from the kitchen, intending to kill his children by flooding the basement with gas. Downstairs, Carly and Josh notice that their parents have gone quiet for some time. Creeping up to the door, the girl sees their mom sealing the holes in the wood with duct tape. Carly pokes at the tape with her finger, but recoils quickly when her mother tries to stab her through the door. With no other choice, she takes her brother and retreats back down to the basement. That night, Josh has gotten weaker and starts to cough. Carly reassures her brother again, insisting things will be okay, and looks around for a way to save them. Going deeper into the basement, she spots large ventilation shafts running below the ceiling and an air vent in the back corner. The teen removes the grating and sees that there's a large crawl space behind it. Coming back out of the back room, Carly also finds a box of matches and some duct tape, but time is running out. Upstairs, the adults hear coughing and get excited. They know that their kids are feeling the full effects of the gas and decide that this is their time to strike. Okay, these kids are complete morons. This basement is likely full of useful tools, including the sledgehammer their father used to smash up the pool table they can see in front of them. Instead of giving their parents so much time to come up with an elaborate plan to kill them with gas, they should have been looking to break out of the basement the moment they first locked themselves in. This window already has a loose screen and is big enough for them to crawl through. They could have broken through it with a sledgehammer from the start and ran to safety while their parents were still trying to break down the basement door. Even now, it is only blocked by two feet of dirt that can be knocked away with minimal force. If the window is somehow too small for the tiny boy to fit through, they can still easily get rid of the hose. Carly here should know that the end of a garden hose does not have grooves that match perfectly with the grooves of a gas valve. Hence, she should have realized that her parents have come up with a flimsy and makeshift method of attaching the the hose to the valve. With this in mind, she can pull the end of the hose sticking into the basement until the whole thing comes loose from the gas valve. By pulling the entire hose into the basement, she takes away mom and dad's option to try their plan again. If she's lucky and her parents don't hear the hose getting detached, the main house might even start filling with gas and suffocate the adults while they wait at the basement door. Another plan Carly can try is to knock the dirt out the window away and push the end of the hose out and stop the room from filling with deadly gas. The siblings can hear their parents right on the other side of the basement door, so they know that no one is watching the hose. Once they do this, they can pretend to go into fits of intense coughing before falling silent. This will trick the adults into believing they are dead. Feeling emboldened, the parents will come in to check on their handiwork. If Josh plays dead near the stairs, Carly can hide in a dark corner with the gun and shoot them both in the head in a surprise ambush when they go to check on Josh. It will not be pleasant to kill her own parents, but if her parents cannot be cured, then making sure they are dead is the only way Carly can ensure safety for her and her brother. Even if the siblings are not in the mood for violence, both of them simply playing dead might work too. Carly has seen that other parents tend to leave and go about their business after believing their kids have been killed. Her and Josh can escape the house once their parents leave after seeing them dead. Coming up with a clever idea, Carly tears apart the matchbox and starts to build something. She takes the ignition strip lining and tapes it to the floor just below the door. The teenager also tapes a row of matches to the bottom of the door and makes sure their heads touch the red phosphorus of the ignition strip. With her traps set, Carly takes her brother to the back of the basement and tells him to climb into the ventilation shaft. Venturing further into the vents, the siblings make their way out of the basement and into the second story of the house. Meanwhile, their father saws away the lock on the door and their mother arms herself with a meat tenderizer. They think their plan has worked and Brent gives his wife a sinister smile as he yanks the door open. The friction sets off the matches, and all the gas that has been pulling in the basement catches fire. It creates a massive fireball that erupts out of the basement, throwing Brent across the room and knocking Kendall to the ground. Recovering from the blast, the woman realizes her husband is still unconscious and heads out to hunt down her children. That's when Carthy sneaks out of the ducks upstairs, telling her brother to remain hidden, but her mother spots her immediately. The woman chases her, and Carthy makes it into her parents' bedroom just in time, and locks the woman out. And the girl hides behind a dresser, sobbing to herself, as her mother slams her body against the door trying to break in. With a large crash, the now crazed woman breaks through the door and attacks her daughter with a tenderizer. She grabs onto the girl, but Carly bites her in the arm and manages to get away. That's when Damon runs upstairs and rushes to help his girlfriend. Entering a bedroom, they try to lock the woman in a closet and trap her inside, but it doesn't work for long. The woman fights back, stabbing Damon with a wire hanger and breaks out. 
the teenager recovers, but then Kendall attacks him, throwing him off the landing, and he lands on the floor, knocked out from the impact. The kids go downstairs to check on him and are horrified to see their dad approach them with the power saw. He's still alive, but burnt and out for blood. The parents corner their children in the kitchen and Carly begs them to stop, apologizing for all the attitude she has given them in the past. It doesn't work, and the adults walk towards them as Carly covers her brother's eyes, ready to accept their fate. Suddenly, they're saved at the last moment by the doorbell ring. It's the grandparents coming for the dinner they had planned before all this started, and Brent opens the door to greet his parents, but is immediately maced by his mother. The grandfather pulls out a small knife and stabs Brent repeatedly. These seniors have gone crazy and have clearly come to kill their son. Okay, Carly's fireball trap is genius. Even though she missed a lot of obvious ways she and Josh could have escaped the basement, the trap ensured that her parents would be blasted back after her and Josh were far out of harm's way. She seems to be willing to kill her parents now, since her trap could easily have been lethal. If this is her mindset, there are actually a lot of more effective and deadly ways she could have used the matches. Carly should have searched the basement for common flammable liquids such as paint thin. This gap under the basement door is more than large enough to allow liquids to flow through. If I were Carly, I would slowly pour the paint thinner under the door and allow it to flow to the other side. I would know that there's a thick carpet right on the other end, which will absorb a large amount of the flammable liquid quickly. I would also leave a trailer of thinner on my end of the door to form an ignition trail. Next, I would use the duct tape to paste a matchstick upright at the very end of this trail. When I can hear my parents on the other end of the door, I would light this match. This gives us a few seconds to run and hide in the vents before the flames burn down the match and ignites the thinner on the floor. The fire would follow the trail of liquid under the door and set the entire carpet outside and anyone standing on it ablaze, burning them all to ashes. Carly's grandparents visiting is also a huge opportunity. They may not have come with gifts, but they can offer something far more valuable assistance to kill her father. With Carly and the news reports she has seen, all having zero leads on a cure of the madness, her parents are almost certainly a lost cause. There is no reason for Carly and her brother to want to spare mom and dad any longer, and killing them would be their best bet for their own safety. If I were Carly, I would not only give my grandpa all the help he needs to kill my dad, I would also try to find a way to turn these angry seniors against my mom. We have no clue how this brainwashing works, and if it's only limited to the urge to kill biological children, I would try to remind my grandparents that by marrying into the family, my mom has become exactly like a daughter to them. It is a long shot, but if we can cause something in the grandparents' brains to switch and genuinely think of Kendall as their own daughter, they would turn on her and help us take her out too. Josh begs his grandfather not to kill his dad, but Brent reacts in anger and charges at the boy. The kid runs away as he's chased by his father, while his grandpa follows after the man, intent on stabbing Brent to death. The three of them run into the garage, and Josh hides inside his dad's sports car. The man tries to crawl in through the open window, but can't get in all the way. That's when the grandfather comes up from behind him and brutally stabs him in the legs. Josh quickly runs away and leaves the two men struggling inside the car. In the kitchen, Kendall begs her mother-in-law not to hurt her husband, but the old woman isn't moved, mocking Kendall for never being good enough for her son. Furious, she maces her, then knocks the old woman away before turning her attention back to Carly. She chases the teen onto the front lawn and is about to bash her head in when the old woman grabs her from behind. Kendall pushes the grandmother into the driveway. At the same time, Brent can't get his father off him and starts the car in desperation. He steps on the gas and backs away, running down the garage door. The car spins out of control and crashes into Brent's mother, throwing her over the sunroof as Brent watches in disbelief. The car ends up crashing into a neighbor's vehicle, and the impact throws the grandpa onto the hood, where the old man cracks his skull open. That makes four victims down, with five survivors left. With her husband knocked out of the crash and both her in-laws dead, Kendall tries to attack Carly again. Suddenly, Damon returns, and knocks knocks the woman out with a shovel to her face. The next day, the parents wake up to find they've been restrained in the wreckage of their home's basement. Seeing their children, they greet them kindly and assure their kids they have changed. Sensing something is still wrong, Carly refuses. Hearing that he will not be getting his way, Brent starts to yell and struggle violently, but the wires tying his hands hold strong. Upset at seeing his parents like this, Josh starts to cry. He tells them both that he loves them, and Carly says she does too, tearing up herself. The parents look on at their heartbroken children and affirm that they do love them very much. Then, Brent repeats that he does care about his kids, then starts to seethe and tremble with anger as he yells they drive him to extremes sometimes, teaching them an important lesson that being a parent sucks. But what do you think? How would you beat mom and dad? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, give a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos like this. And don't forget that from now on, we'll be uploading on Wednesdays and Saturdays. Until next time, have a damn good day.